Good evening. I'm Leland Vitter. There is a race against time right now in the South China Sea. How the crash of America's most advanced fighter jet could lead us ever closer to a war with China. Plus, exclusive video showing a major shift in the Biden administration's border policy. The reporter who captured these images tell us why they will bring thousands more across the Rio Grande. But first, a political rescue worthy of any action movie. Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer has retired, changing the narrative in Washington and the fortunes of the Biden presidency. Take a step back and look at the political landscape as it stood this morning. President Biden had a 15-point spread between disapprove and approve. Disapprove, 55%. President Biden this morning badly needed a win, any win. Every night, there has been more bad news for the administration on COVID, Ukraine, inflation, the border. We've talked about them all. Now, none of that matters. There is a Supreme Court vacancy for the media to talk about every minute. The who will it be, the votes, the hearings, the stagecraft, the emotion. This is not a gift for Mr. Biden. This is not a life raft to a man shipwrecked. Rather, it is akin to a Coast Guard helicopter plucking someone out of the Arctic Sea in the middle of a winter storm. The entire Biden presidency just turned on a dime. In the next 90 days, Mr. Biden, and in a larger sense, Democrats, are guaranteed a huge win. Chuck Schumer says there will be quick confirmation hearings and they will confirm whoever the president picks. Nothing energizes the base like a Supreme Court justice, giving the president and Democrats major tailwinds heading into the summer and midterm election season. Of course, it also gives the media something else to talk about. This is not us saying it, but Senator Lindsey Graham, a Republican who sits on the Senate Judiciary Committee. If all Democrats hang together, which I expect they will, Graham writes, they have the power to replace Justice Breyer in 2022 without one Republican vote in support. Elections have consequences, and it is most evident when it comes to fulfilling Supreme Court vacancies. Now begins the D.C. parlor game. Who will it be? The other cable nets each have their lists, and today the White House doubled down on Mr. Biden's campaign promise to nominate an African-American female to the court. As you look, MSNBC, CNN, and Fox all had a number of their options. Right now, the court sick sits six Republican appointees, three Democratic. So it doesn't matter as much as who the president nominates as that a Democrat gets confirmed. Politically, a win's a win. The confirmation hearings are going to be must-see TV. Josh Hawley will be one of the Republican senators to question the nominee. This is from Hawley. If he, meaning the president, chooses to nominate a left-wing activist who will bless his campaign against parents, his abuse of the FBI, his refusal to enforce our immigration laws, and his lawless vaccine mandates, expect a major battle in the Senate. When in doubt, listen to Lindsey Graham over Josh Hawley. And as much as the junior senator from Missouri would love to launch his presidential campaign by taking down a Supreme Court nominee, history shows that's near impossible. In recent history, going back to the Reagan times, only three Supreme Court nominees have failed. Merrick Garland didn't get a hearing, obviously. He was not nominated by President Obama in 2016 after the death of Antonin and Scalia, so that's not going to happen here. Harriet Myers, former George W. Bush White House counsel, it's unlikely that that's going to happen here, considering who some of the names are. Robert Bork, Reagan-nominated judge, was one who failed. Even Clarence Thomas survived. Thomas now is almost certain to hold on for another three years and not retire. As much as Hawley would like the spotlight, the woman to watch on the Senate Judiciary Committee is Marsha Blackburn, senator from Tennessee. She will have much wider, la wider latitude in going after a potential female nominee in the confirmation hearing. So, lots to talk about. Joining us now, Ian Samuel, former law clerk for the late Justice Antonin Scalia, and Melanie Campbell, president and CEO of the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation. Nice to see you both. Um, Melanie, no secret the president's you been too. having political problems over the past, say, six months, certainly the past month in particular. Mm. I'm wondering what the difference in the conversation between your friends in the past week and then in the past, say, six hours has been. Uh, well, I can tell you, um, for the black women uh, that I work with very closely and others, uh, we are uh, we were excited to hear, uh, first of all, 
uh, thank uh, Justice Breyer for his service, of course, but also that uh, to hear that President Biden uh, made a campaign uh, uh, promise, if you will, uh, that he would uh, nominate a, a African American woman to the Supreme Court. I and so there was a lot of uh, discussion about that in the last few hours, uh, and so we're looking forward to seeing uh, that take place. In so much of this is going to be for Republicans sit back and pop some popcorn and sort of watch it happen. Um, is there, from a political standpoint and from the court standpoint looking forward, it sort of doesn't matter who the president nominates. Republicans are going to oppose. Democrats are going to approve. We're going to move on and stay 6-3. Well, I think, well, I think, I think that's the fact that possibly this... true. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, and, and I think that, that uh, because Justice Breyer is a member of a three-member, uh, you know, liberal minority, uh, the stakes aren't like it, they were when, for example, Justice Kennedy retired. At the same time, um, this is a 50-50 Senate, and I don't think that the president can take for granted that, for example, Joe Manchin or uh, Senator Sinema uh, will necessarily approve anybody he nominates at all. Now, at the same time, everybody understand, anybody who tells you that the nominee is going to be anybody other than Ketanji Brown Jackson or Leandra Kruger, uh, who, is a, who are respectively on the D.C. Uh, DC Circuit and the California Supreme Court, um, anybody who tells you it's going to be anybody other than those people uh, is messing with you. I don't think that those nominees are equivalent to every single senator, uh, but I agree with you that probably it, it's, the yeah, stakes are not as high maybe as right. some suggest. Manchin, Manchin and Simmons, though, they already voted for KBJ, as she's now being called. Mike Allen said uh, you had RGB, you have ACB, you have Amy Coney Barrett, now you have RBJ. Um, I want to bring... Uh, uh, although you have, you have Brett Kavanaugh, BK. What about LK? <laughs> LK's not so bad. Uh, I figured that. Uh, all right. So, Melanie, I'm... I'm thinking about in terms of, of how this plays for the midterms politically. Poll importance of Supreme Court uh, in elections. This is in the 2020 election. 79% say the economy is very important. 68% health care. 64% say Supreme Court appointments are extremely important. Uh, how much of this, the timing on this retirement is a tacit acknowledgement by Stephen Breyer that Democrats are headed for a possible loss of the majority in November, and therefore it's better to retire and get his replacement in place before that? Well, I, I, I wouldn't say that Justice Breyer is necessarily doing it because of the midterms. You have to ask him that question. But I think what's very important, one of the things that happened in 2020, we conduct a poll, the, our Black Women's Roundtable in Essence Magazine, every year. And la, in, in 2020, two-thirds of the black women, over a thousand women that we uh, polled, said that they that the issue around the Supreme Court was very, very critical. So when I heard you talk about the data, that we, we know that was also for black women as well. So we're in this moment where we know this is a lifetime appointment. Um, yes, we know that there are ideology uh, differences on the court, but I think the reality is that um, patience sometimes is a virtue. And, hmm. and we've been fighting for this for uh, over 12 years, a lot of us who have really been pushing for the diversity um, on the court. In almost 240 years now that hey, we're talking about, there's hey, never been hey, a black woman on the court. Yeah, I know, and, and, and then- on, on the highest then, court. Then, then, then candidate Biden made that point and said it's about time. Now it appears that's gonna happen. Uh, Ian, does this neuter uh, Democrats' argument of packing the court if now Biden, Mr. Biden gets a Supreme Court nominee? Well, I mean, as a one of these hotheads who think that they should have packed the court already, uh, which, of course, all of the game theorists uh, in my life explained to me would never work, uh, it doesn't neuter their argument for packing the court because they have no intention of doing so whatsoever. None. Zero. Biden, he commissioned his little, you know, committee that's going to make recommendations about court reform and things like that. But, uh, but no, basically it doesn't because... But, Justice Breyer is going to retire and be replaced with a person of a very similar ideology. I mean, Justice or, or Judge Jackson is a Breyer clerk, and Justice mm -hmm. Kruger on the California Supreme Court is a clerk for John Paul Stevens. So this does not change anything. No, it is a 6-3 court that, by the way, that, by the way, don't forget this. 
the last thing that's going to happen before Justice Breyer retires is the Supreme Court is going to uphold this Mississippi abortion law. And that is going to change the character of these confirmation hearings a great deal. Now that's that's a good uh, a good point to end on, and uh, you think you think that for Joe Manchin, it's a lot easier to vote, say, for uh, Judge Jackson than it would be to vote to uh, pack the court, which you would have to. Hey, Ian, Melanie, thank you both. We appreciate Indeed. it. Good to see you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Now to Bye. a case likely to end up at the Supreme Court. Exercising your Second Amendment right now comes with an insurance requirement. An insurance requirement in San Jose, California. Under the rules now, gun owners have to pay a $25 yearly fee. They're required to carry liability insurance or face fines, although not criminal charges. The city can impound weapons if you don't have the fee paid in the insurance, but gun owners won't flat out lose their weapon. These requirements affect roughly 55,000 gun owners in San Jose, a population of more than a million people there in that city. The ordinance is part of a push to reduce the impacts of gun violence. Here's a look at violent crime in San Jose. Homicides, 31, 730 rapes, 1,200 robberies, 2,700 aggravated assaults. San Jose Mayor Sam Licardo says gun violence costs the city more than $400 million a year. He joins us now. Mayor, it's good to see you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Um, I'm be trying with you, to understand, of, of these crimes, 31 homicides, 730 rapes, 1,200 robberies, 2,700 aggravated assaults, how many were committed with legal guns that these, this insurance policy would have paid for? Yeah, I think it's important for us to understand the, the broader scope of gun harm. I don't have a, a good answer for you. Uh, okay. But what I can tell you is that uh, the majority of deaths in this country that are gun inflicted are from suicide, not from homicide. Uh, a third of the emergency room admissions uh, are as a result of gun inflicted injuries are, are as a result of unintentional shootings. Uh, not intentional shooting. So there's a lot of gun harm that we can reduce independent of all the crimes you're talking about, because we know that there's no magic ordinance that's going to suddenly take a weapon out of the hand of a crook. Uh, what we're trying to do is reduce uh, and, and hopefully eliminate the deaths and preventable injuries that are out there that we know are being committed uh, how exactly does lawful gun owners. OK, so but how does charging a twenty five dollar insurance fee that then covers insurance losses or damages resulting from any accidental use of a firearm, including death, injury, or property damage. How does that prevent suicides? Actually, uh, that's not what the ordinance requires. There are two different elements here, and I think you've conflated them. First, there's an insurance requirement, liability insurance, which is broadly available in the market today for any homeowner or renter. Sure. And in some cases, at no additional cost or very little additional cost. Separately, there is a fee mandate that we're imposing on gun owners uh, that helps to pay through a nonprofit foundation for uh, violence prevention and gun harm prevention. And that can be everything from domestic violence prevention to suicide prevention to mental health services to gun safety classes. So it's those direct services, particularly to occupants in, 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 in gun owning households that can dramatically reduce gun harm in our community. That sounds an awful lot like a, a tax of same kind of like a tax on alcohol to pay for DUI checkpoints. Uh, yes, it's not a tax. It is a fee. Long story as to what the difference is out here in California. It's a big. I, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure the lawyers battle. have a reason behind it. Yes, but it, but it's a yes. It, it is something that gun owners would pay uh, that funds uh, basic services that are, are are entirely focused on occupants of their own households. Okay, so so uh, if. Because, I understand. I mean, look, it's a lot easier to tax or to charge a fee to legal gun owners because they pay. They they are legal by definition and law abiding. Right. Whereas illegal uh, guns and gun owners don't typically call the mayor's office or the police department and say, "Let me register my gun." If right. guns are as big of a problem as you talk about, would you be in favor of higher penalties for illegal gun crimes? Oh, of course. I'm a former criminal prosecutor, and that's. Uh, I've had enough uh, cases where I know if, if we could have put somebody behind bars uh, longer before they got out to commit the next crime, uh, I would have been perfectly happy with that. Uh, this, is, this is not about going soft on crime. This is about reducing gun harm in all of its forms. So, so in other and, words, you're basically saying this, if you want to own a gun legally, you have to pay a, a tax or a fee or whatever you want to call it so that you can pay for education to other people to not harm themselves with guns? Uh, well, it's, it's much more than education, but here's what we know about 
from the epidemiology uh, is that if you live in a house where a gun is owned, uh, that you are much more likely to be a victim of homicide, about twice as likely, about three times more likely to be uh, be, be using that gun in suicide. Uh, if you're in a domestic violence situation, there's a gun in the house, you're five times more likely uh, to have a fatal result if there's a gun in that household. So we want to deliver the services to those occupants of those households because that's where the risk and the harm is. So, uh, and so yeah, go ahead. No, 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 I, no it's, it's, it's an interesting way of doing it. Uh, you're a Democrat, and obviously when Democrats start putting new restrictions on guns or taxes or fees or whatever you want to call them, um, you're going to have a, a, you know, you're going to have a Second Amendment challenge here. How do you sure. plan to get around that? Uh, in fact, the, the lawsuits have already been filed. So yeah, that's we, why we're having you on. We have these challenges. Uh, look, the Second Amendment protects every American's right to own and possess a gun. Uh, it doesn't require that taxpayers subsidize that right, and that's exactly what's happening today in the city of San Jose. Uh, nearly $40 million being spent by taxpayers for merely the public response to gun harm and gun violence in the form of emergency room. Yeah, but but uh, I got to think, so if you've got 31 homicides, 730 rapes, 1,200 robberies, and 27 aggra aggravated assaults, a lot of that $40 million is from illegal gun crime. Why should legal gun owners subsidize the cost of illegal gun crime? Because, in fact, an enormous amount of harm is being caused uh, by guns that are owned by law-abiding gun owners. As I mentioned, the majority of deaths, not by homicide, but by suicide. More than a third of gun-related injuries in our emergency rooms are unintentional shootings. We have more than four and a half million children in this country who live in a home where a gun is kept, loaded, and unlocked. There's a lot we can do with law-abiding gun owners to make us all safer, including the gun owners and their families themselves. You, you said something interesting when you said this is not about being soft on crime, because we looked and, you know, you obviously have a prosec prosecutor's background, and then Santa Clara County District Attorney Jeff Rosen, um, who I'm sure you're well aware with, is not soft on crime in any way, um, and is, is noted that he's in a tight re-election race. His opponent is pushing for alternatives to incarceration. Eight out of 10 people in the community support, but he and you tow this tougher on crime uh, line. How do you square that with the community response saying they want lighter sentences? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to, tougher on crime line, either for myself or District Attorney Rosen. Uh, I've been very clear that- well, you, 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 not, you said it yourself, I mean, you're not soft on crime. You said, Jose. I'm sorry. You, you said it yourself, you're not soft on crime, right? Uh, well, uh, look, I, 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 it depends uh, which issue you're talking okay. about, about where I line up, but I can tell you, no, I am not soft on crime. I'm a former criminal prosecutor, and I believe uh, that there's an appropriate use for, for jails and prisons in our society. Got it. Hey, I, I, I appreciate this. Um, it, we're going to have you back sometime. I'd love to, love to talk a little bit more about this and also sort of track how some of this money ends up getting spent and what happens with it. It's good to see you, Mayor. We always appreciate it. Someone who's coming on and willing to defend uh, his position and his policy. It's un more unusual and un unusual in politics for someone to be willing to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Leland. It's a pleasure. Yeah. The State Department is looking to avoid Afghanistan part two as Putin continues to threaten Ukraine, what the U.S. is doing to get Americans out. Plus, the Biden administration claims to be deporting single adult migrants, but new video shows dozens at the airport. The reporter who took the video of all these folks being sent around the country, tell us where they're headed. New video tonight from inside the San Antonio airport. You can see lines of illegal immigrants waiting to board planes. We don't know where they are going. There's some speculation it's possibly to another detention center, but that seems highly unlikely and unusual in a commercial airport with no security around them. Or more likely, they have been released with a notice to appear in court. They're all carrying the same yellow bags tra packed with travel necessities. Some, emphasis some, appear to be wearing ankle monitors. Also tonight, new video from the Texas Department of Public Safety showing troopers arresting about a dozen immigrants hiding inside a dump truck Judging by the video, most of the migrants are single men traveling alone. They used to be deported because under a current federal rule known as Title 42, Customs and Border Protection 
are supposed to deport single adults after they're caught trying to enter the country. Seems as though that may not be happening. Independent journalist Ali Bradley was at the airport this morning, took that exclusive video, now is in Brownsville, Texas, where it appears the same mm -hmm. thing is happening. Ali, so are we right to think this is as big of a change in policy as it seems? Yeah, Leland, absolutely it is. And you, you mentioned there was some speculation on these people going to de another detention facility. That is absolutely not the case. I spoke with these individuals. They're telling me some of them are going to Chicago. Some are going to Miami to link up with families. Now, something interesting, too, is border agents, several of them have told me that they have no way to even vet these sponsors or families that are picking them up outside of calling it and making sure that that number exists. So a lot of things are happening here at the border. And there's still a lot of people that don't believe that these numbers Numbers are real and that this is actually going on. Yeah, we, we keep getting record numbers, record numbers in the hundreds of thousands. Uh, you said you talked to these people. Did they know this ahead of time that when they got here, they were going to be released or was this a hope and a prayer? So I'm going to tell you this, Leland, you know that I walked with the caravan, 5,000 people. A lot of those folks are now in the state, single adult men as well. Now, when I was walking with them, I asked them, are you worried at all? Some of them have already been deported once from the U.S. I said, are you worried at all that you just have an economic claim and you're trying to get in? They said, not at all. And they told me that Mr. Biden will honor those asylum claims. So they are coming over, even if it's an economic claim and they are claiming asylum. That is what they're telling me. Yeah, and there is this big difference, right, between what the White House was saying yesterday and what we heard from Immigration and Customs Enforcement today. This is Jen Psaki reacting to video of people being dropped off near where you were yesterday. Take a listen. Migrants who cannot be expelled under Title 42 are placed into immigration proceedings. And one of those avenues could be placement in an alternative to detention program in the interior of the United States. Sometimes that means moving migrants to other parts of the United States to move to different detention facilities where they wait for next steps in the immigration process, such as a court hearing, and are required to check in with a local ICE uh, office. Then this That's is not from. True. <laughs> You beat me to it. Okay, this is from ICE. Individuals deemed suitable for release are released in coordination with local partners and are subject to reporting requirements associated with their immigration proceedings. Is that accurate? Leland, I'm going to tell you what I know. These folks are being released on a notice to appear on their own recognizance. Okay, so some of them had an ankle monitor, like you pointed out. When I talked to three gentlemen, they didn't have a cell phone given to them by immigration or an ankle monitor. So it really is on their own recognizance. So when Jen Psaki is saying they're ATD, that's the alternative to detention, ICE and Border Patrol are both confirming to me that that is not true. And, they and are it, getting NTAs and ORs. And so many of these, I feel like, are, are now calling friends in their home countries and saying, hey, I'm in, I'm in Chicago or Nashville or Milwaukee now. Come on. You know, Leland, you're right. And there's also American citizens helping these folks. Because I've talked to a couple of, you know, Venezuelan men that are here that have friends telling them that live in the state saying now's the time to come. This is a pathway to take. And here's how to do it. And I'm going to tell you something. I was in La Jolla yesterday. They've now apprehended people that have claimed asylum and are in our country that are now smuggling people and breaking the law. They're Did smuggling illegal immigrants as legal asylum seekers. So it's, there's a lot going on here. <laughs> Well, you, your reporting on this has really, really been excellent. And you have one of the reasons we want to have you on so much is because you have the nitty gritty experience, right? You've been with the caravan. Now you're there in South Texas. I don't know if you saw this story, but evidently there were people being smuggled in a coffin. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any pictures. Authorities observed a coffin in the back of a van, asked what he was transporting. The guy replied, dead guy, Navy guy. They discovered two Mexican nationals concealed inside a coffin covered with an American flag. Uh, I, I'm guessing this doesn't really surprise you. It does not at all. I have not heard of that yet, but no, we're seeing them clone semi trucks. We're, you know, pretending they're businesses. We're seeing them use dump trucks. I mean, they're pulling out all the stops at this juncture because, you know, these law enforcement individuals are catching on. And so, you know, they're using younger kids and they're recruiting them off of Snapchat. We know college kids are doing this, U.S. citizens. Mm. So, you know, there's a lot of moving parts here. And this is a multifaceted thing. I keep saying that this isn't just one layer and one issue. And there's not just one fix. Each area has a different issue going on, Leland. Well, Allie, keep up the great work and the great reporting. We're always grateful to have you on. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Be well. Thank you.
All right. Well, the Biden administration is focused right now on another border thousands of miles away. We certainly heard that from Jen Psaki today. Russian President Vladimir Putin has amassed hundreds of thousands of troops ready to roll into Ukraine. Russia is threatening, in their words, retaliatory measures if their demands are not met. The Biden administration says they're trying to meet some of those demands and have sent a letter to Moscow. News Nation's Kelly Meyer in Washington with more on the letter tonight. Good evening, Kelly. Good evening, Leland. Well, the U.S. says they are not giving in to Russia's demands. Basically, Russia asked for this written response from the U.S. and NATO allies saying that Ukraine won't be allowed into NATO. This is something that the U.S. and NATO allies have said is off the table, and that's what they said in the letter. But they did suggest other ways to work with Russia here to avoid a war. But the NATO, NATO allies and U.S. have been trying to reach this uh, solution diplomatically for weeks, even months now, without success. So the State uh, Department secretary was asked today why we are writing responses, written letters to Russia when they are amassing some thousands and thousands of troops on the border. Why aren't we pushing back against Putin more? Here's what he had to say. We're, as you know, not, uh, not standing still. And we uh, can walk and chew gum at the same time. And that's very much what we've been doing. And Leland, we're actually hearing some response and reaction from Russia tonight to this letter. They say Washington's uh, response is, quote, unsatisfactory. And they also say that now Russia is free to do whatever it wants next. Yeah, well, the Russians kind of said niet and then moved on. But typically, Vladimir Putin does whatever he wants to do, sort of regardless of what the world says until he gets punched in the nose. Uh, caught in the middle of this are going to be a lot of Americans, right? You've got Ukrainian Americans who have dual citizenship. You also have thousands of Americans who do business in Ukraine. Uh, how much help is the State Department giving them to get out or, or like in Afghanistan, are a lot of Americans on their own? Yeah, the Biden administration is really trying to avoid another chaotic withdrawal like we saw this summer. They're trying to say they've learned their lesson from that, and they are trying to be more proactive here. You can see this uh, message from the State Department going out, urging Americans there to leave immediately. They're also uh, ordering families uh, and top diplomats at the U.S. Embassy to leave Kiev. And they also say they are providing some support and assistance for those commercial flights and giving out loans. Uh, but they say, basically, uh, if you don't leave now, we may not be able to come back in and and rescue you, letting them know that they might not be able to come back in, something they haven't really been able to do with Afghanistan, as we mm -hmm. see that there are still Americans left behind there. Yeah, we were talking earlier that essentially the Ukrainian forces on the border are basically speed bumps if the Russians actually decide to move uh, into Ukraine. Uh, this caught our eye also, and I know you've been able to do a little bit of reporting on it, but in the South China Sea right now, there's a massive military operation ongoing to try and pull an F-35, America's most advanced fighter jet, out of the South China Sea before the Chinese can get it. This is video from the Daily Mail of the jet taking off, or trying to, and it doesn't go anywhere. The pilot ejects, the F-35 goes to the bottom of the ocean, and now you've got America's most classified technology uh, at the bottom of the ocean. Who gets this? Yeah, it's really a race between the U.S. and China to who gets there first. And this is the U.S. Navy's most advanced fighter jet now sitting at the bottom of the South China Sea. As you said, it's the F-35C. It crashed on the aircraft carrier during a routine operation on Monday. The Navy is giving few details. We just reached out tonight for more information. And again, not giving much information on how exactly they're going to retrieve this. And their vessels that are on their way could take up to two weeks. They're about two weeks from the crash site. And China is now saying they could claim salvage rights by calling this an environmental hazard and go in and retrieve this. And Leland, this is a high-tech spy plane that we don't want getting in the hands of the Chinese. And with this race to get there, China may get there first, and it may even take four months to retrieve it completely from the bottom mm. of the South China Sea. Leland? Yeah, well, you said that the Navy isn't saying much. You have to ask why the Navy said anything at all and didn't keep this secret, so maybe at least keep the Chinese guessing. Uh, keep our eye on the South China Sea. You can imagine an aircraft carrier group and the Chinese salvage vessels meeting would be interesting. Kelly, good to see you. We'll talk to you tomorrow night. Thank you. What happens? Thank you. This is another bad thing. What happens when oil hits $100 a barrel? How about $150 a barrel? Markets are getting worried. We're going to tell you what it means and why big oil prices mean a lot more than big gas prices.
Federal Reserve today said what every American's been feeling for the past six months. Rising prices are crushing all of us. The Federal Reserve's only remedy is to raise interest rates, which will mean short-term pain for all of us, hopefully to make things a little bit better. It comes as oil is topping $90 a barrel for the first time since 2014. Some are blaming supply, others Ukraine. It doesn't much matter why prices are so high, as they will likely go higher. Joining us now, Paul Sankey, lead analyst for Sankey Research, who covers the oil industry. Uh, say it ain't so, but I hear people are betting not on 100 but $150 a barrel. Well, we'll see. I mean, the, the demand side is still strong. It's cold here in New York. Um, and obviously, we've got the problems in Russia on the supply side as regards the risk of a Ukraine invasion. Uh, we've got OPEC trying to manage the market, but not producing as much oil as maybe uh, we thought they, they could. And, and that's another concern for the market. So we've got strong demand and worries about supply. Uh, over the course of this year, we'll, we'll, we'll potentially uh, be going up into the hundreds and beyond. Absolutely. It seems like OPEC has got to be loving this, right? Because every barrel now that they were getting 40 or $50 a barrel during the pandemic, they're now getting 100 or $150 a barrel. That's pure profit um, for them. You talked about demand, and we think about gas. It's not just gasoline. It's the input to almost everything that the American consumer and the American economy does revolves around the price of oil. Well, I've got to correct you slightly there, Lynn. OPEC doesn't like prices going too high. And the last time we went super high, which was in 2008, oil went to $150 a barrel. Actually, the Saudis stepped in. The Saudi king stepped in directly and said $120 a barrel was too high. And the reason for that, obviously, is that they worry that people are going to stop using oil, that we're going to uh, be encouraged to buy electric vehicles and everything else. And so there's an there's a, a optimum point for them, which is around here, actually, and maybe up towards 100. But beyond that, it becomes a concern. Overall, there's, there's definitely a worry, as, you, as you're implying, that you know, as we go above 100, it becomes a real problem for everyone because we use so much oil and it's so much part of our daily lives, absolutely. Yeah, you think about you know, meat prices, hotels, airline tickets, thing, you know, everything that gets yeah, to the grocery I mean, store, it all, it all comes into oil. It's, it's interesting. I, I'm glad to have you on because one of the reasons we really look to you as an expert is you're not political, as so many people in this discussion are. This is Daniel Turner, who's uh, admittedly a, an analyst and a uh, lobbyist for the oil and gas industry. This is what he had to say about rising prices. Take a listen. Go back just a couple of years, 2019, when we were producing more oil and gas than we had historically. Um, and the rhetoric then was that the Trump administration was in the pocket of big oil. Um, their profits weren't nearly what they are now. He, he was arguing basically that the Trump administration's domestic energy policy produced these huge numbers of domestic American made oil that kept the prices down. Is that a fair argument? Well, you know, if you believe in conspiracy theories, you believe two things. You believe the government is smart and the government can keep a secret. And so, no, I don't really agree. I mean, we haven't seen, in fact, historically, uh, the oil companies have done better under uh, Democrat administrations than they have under Republican. Also, I, I mentioned that I, the reason I'm an independent analyst is that I don't work for a big Wall Street bank, so I can be as political as I want, which particularly is uh, as regards China, actually. Um, you know, most Wall Street analysts can't say bad things about totalitarian government in China, but I can say what I want. Well, but yeah, we, no, the, we it's, enjoy, it's we, as, we enjoy doing that here. That. We, we definitely enjoy doing <laughs> that here. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll throw you this question then. How does this play into Putin's uh, analyst, analyst right now in terms of the possible war in Ukraine? Because as John McCain said, Russia is a gas station masquerading as a country. Well, you know, we've got a weak administration here in the U.S. We've got the U.K. Uh, government is in a birthday party scandal, uh, you know, and the list goes on. Can you name the German chancellor? I'm sure you can, but I'm sure 99.9% .9 of people can't. So that you've got a very weak political construct here, and you've got Vladimir Putin, who basically plays 4D chess, right? I mean, it's a really interesting uh, series of uh, game theories that you have to apply as to whether or not Putin is messing with us, whether he's taking advantage of this very weak political construct we have in the West, the fact that he's supplying Europe with all its gas in the middle of winter. I'm finding it really difficult to decide whether or not he's going to go for it. The word from DC intelligence, from the Pentagon, is it's a high risk, that it's a 70% yeah. 
chance that he does invade. I'm not so sure because he could lose a tremendous amount here if he really forces the agenda as regards European dependence on Russian gas. That is to say, if he does something as big as invade Ukraine, it might trigger Europe into getting a better energy policy that would be obviously very defensive about using US, uh, Europe, uh, excuse me, Russian gas. And therefore, you know, Putin could shoot, shoot himself in the foot. So it's a really complicated setup. The, the overarching difficulty, as you know, is he's got this imperial, this Russian imperial view of the world where he feels Ukraine should be part of Russia. And at this moment in history, the West is very weak politically. So yeah, no, he wants to tough one to call. Yeah, he wants to bring back the USSR. I don't think anybody's going to write a uh, profile in Courage on uh, Olaf Scholz. Uh, the Chancellor of Germany uh, anytime soon. Uh, well, it's hey, more actually. It's more about it's more about the Russian Empire than the USSR. So he really wants to go back to a Tsarist. That's why they, that he bought back the eagle symbol yeah. for Russia. It's I actually think, going uh, he, back to sort of Peter the Great. Yeah, built himself some kind of fifty million dollar uh, palace too. Hey, Paul, I appreciate you being with us. Next time we're talking China, all right? Sure. Good to see you. Imagine having a three-day weekend every week. Up next, why some say the four-day work weeks are the wave of the future. Explaining the mundane five-day work week so many Americans experience and shows would like to all of us to work a lot less. Perhaps four days would help. Just 5%, though, of workers in the United States work four days. 84% five days, 11% six days. Liberty Vitter, professor at Washington University, St. Louis, features editor of the Harvard Data Science Review, and my favorite sister join us now. Uh, all right, so if you want to pitch to your boss, four days works, the data is what? I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue this side because you're asking me to, but I'm not sure the data is quite there. It's there in snapshots. It's there in trials. Microsoft did a trial um, for one August in an office in Japan um, saying that every Friday in this month of August, people get off work, and they increased productivity by 40%. Now, if you're trying to convince your boss, stop there, because that's about as far as you're going to get. I feel like, though, and the reason we wanted to have you on of this is you have a unique uh, view of this because you're an academic in which four-day work weeks is like double what you all normally do. So I, I feel like you could really spread, spread some light on exactly the benefits of this. You know, one would think so, and I'm sure you've seen how much I work while I'm around the house, Lucky, so you're using some insider knowledge here. But here's the deal. The number of jobs that offer four-day work weeks haven't changed in the past three years. There's a reason for that. It doesn't work. If companies actually thought they could be more productive, whatever that means they have to do, if they thought they could really increase sales and increase money, don't you think they'd be doing it? So for all these companies that are experimenting, wouldn't you think they looked at the companies that did experiment, like Microsoft, and say, well, then why aren't they still doing it right now? There's a reason for that. Okay, so my tease that we're going to help people get a four-day work week didn't really work out. Viewers are very disappointed, but 80% of managers 35 and younger, shocker, uh, approve of the four-day work week. Very tight labor market. Are there companies using this as, say, a recruiting tool? Absolutely, and that's why they're doing it as a recruiting tool. If it doesn't work to increase productivity of the workers, at least it gets workers in the door. Mm. But the problem with using this as a method to get in workers is then workers are going to say, well, what's next? What's my next perk? Is it a three-day work week? My, 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 ne my, ne my next perk is working in academia. <laughs> that's the next perk. We got I like how he keeps using this personal hey, I only got, you know, I only got, I only got, point. I only got one joke per segment. That was it. <laughs> we'll see you next week. All right, we want to know what you think. What is the best argument to your boss for a four-day work week? You can tell us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. We'll be right back. Good rule of thumb in this business. If somebody writes or tweets with a thought, 50 people are feeling that way, maybe 100. And we've been hearing from a lot of you about how we refer to President Biden and former President Trump. Keith Hugo on Facebook, big Steelers fan, you need to stop calling President Biden Mr. Biden. It's very disrespectful. It doesn't matter if you don't like him, respect the office, and refer to him as President, not Mr. 
You're right, Keith. The office of the president deserves special respect, regardless of who's behind the Resolute Desk in the Oval Office. On first reference, he is always, on this show, President Biden. Later in stories, it shows respect to refer to him as Mr. Biden as opposed to Biden. For example, if we did a story about the Steelers, Keith, we would refer to quarterback Ben Roethlisberger later on the story simply as Roethlisberger. Without the Mr. Mr. Biden gets special treatment. Along the same vein, Donnie Blackwell, why didn't you refer to President Biden as Mr. Biden, then stated President Trump? Unbiased news, am I missing something? I'm an independent looking for unbiased news options. A slightly different question, Donnie, you are missing just one thing. And since we are fiercely dedicated to unbiased news, we wanted to explain. Mr. Biden is second reference, but the first time we refer to, refer to President Trump, we use president. Former presidents keep the title, but don't get the Mr. on second reference. So first time, it's still president or former President Trump. Then after, it's just Trump. But Mr. Biden, while he is in office, is always Mr. Biden. And I'll be the first to admit, when it's not in the teleprompter, who knows what happens sometimes. But we certainly try hard to honor the office Mr. Biden currently holds. Each network has their own standards and style. The important thing is that it's the same regardless of who is in the office. As our executive producer, Chris Russell, likes to say, the standard is the standard. And we try hard to respond to some of the best of your questions and thoughts, which brings us back to our social media question today. What is the best argument to your boss for the four-day work week? We read them all and we will respond. That's all our time tonight. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.